has a smile so wide and love in my eyes. I love the human race. I love the human race. I love the human race. race. Alright, click track. Welcome back to Janky Town USA. Janky Town USA brought to you unofficially and always by Bex Non Alcoholic. Bex Non Alcoholic, it's beer. Uh, also brought to you by the Beer Bro. The Beer Bro, it's for your beer, bro. And it'd be great if Beer Bro could send us another one of their <laughs> wonderful bottle openers because I can't find mine right now. So Jankytown USA brought to you today also by Bic Small Lighters, who didn't mm-hmm. approve that sponsorship either. And we're going to have our Bex non-alcoholic today with a, with a little lime. You don't have to have it with a lime um, because the taste is obviously quite smooth and refreshing as it is. But sometimes you, you can put a lime on it. I want to resist the idea that Corona has the monopoly on the lime. So I'm going to spritz this in here. I don't know if you could hear that at home, but it's going in just nice. We're going to dunk it in there. Hear this. Some of that beautiful fizzing. Oh, yes. Taste of delicious refreshment with no hangover Mm. okay so welcome back back again yes back again um i was i was uh editing episode five Mm -hmm. and uh had a couple of notes which i'll touch on briefly if that's all right um the things, a couple of things that struck out to me, we were talking about um, the greatest speeches of all time mm-hmm. or, or political sorry, speeches, political speeches in the United States. Yeah, I guess that's that's the that's good to narrow down our category there. And um, um, what, I, what I think could be um, should be uh, brought up for consider consideration, even though it's like kind of a weird speech or it's a very um, different context than those other speeches is Nixon's farewell speech, because that was a very, um, well, certainly historically significant speech, Mm -hmm. but I'd argue a very, very good speech too. I would argue years before he sort of made his, you know, um, his long drawn out concession to David Frost of, you know, everyone wanted mm-hmm. a public apology or all of this. I think in this, um, I've watched it a couple of times. I haven't watched it in a while, but I have watched it before, but there's that, um, I'll just read the last two paragraphs, but there's that very famous, um, speech. And then, and then I want to connect that to something that's just happened recently that I think is a wonderful little duality slash analogy. So, um, The last two paragraphs are, And so I say to you on this occasion, we leave. We leave proud of the people who have stood by us and worked for us and served this country. We want you to be proud of what you've done. We want you to continue to serve in government if that is your wish. Always give your best. Never get discouraged. Never be petty. Always remember, others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. And that was like in the last paragraph. And so we leave with high hopes, in good spirit, and with deep humility, and with much, and with very much gratefulness in our hearts. I can only say to each and every one of you, we come from many faiths. We pray perhaps to different gods, but really the same God in a sense. But I want to say for each and every one of you, not only will we always remember you, not only will we be always grateful to you, but always you will be in our hearts and you will be in our prayers. Thank you very much. I think the line, the famous line from that speech is the destroy yourself line. Mm -hmm. Because it seemed like he was just doing this. um, Is it mea culpa? What is it called when you have like a... Mea culpa literally means my fault. Yeah, okay. So it was kind of like a... Yeah. Maybe maybe it wasn't a mea culpa then, but it was a very... You know, Nixon for... They called him like Tricky Dick, right? And like Mm -hmm. all this. But he seemed like he was very... 
it was like it was like when you get like some very brief glimpse into like that person actually experiencing like a genuine moment for themselves and with the mm-hmm. audience at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, because I feel like he, he honestly believed that he kind of like, he, it seems like he was such a skilled politician that he kind of knew that he did this to himself. Right. On one level he needed, he had to, but I, you know, how conscious he was of that. I don't know. Mm. But that one line about, you know, <clears throat> if you hate others, you end up destroying yourself. <clears throat> That's, pretty much what he did that's why i'm saying that's that's why i'm saying it was he was so it was such a self-aware moment because he was like and this is why i separate we talked about nixon versus trump this is why i kind of separate nixon from trump because i feel like this this is a moment you probably would not get from trump i can't it would be extremely difficult to imagine doing that yeah this is very conciliatory here i mean he kind of like so um Anyways, I think that should be entered into the register for, <clears throat> and and I say and I and I would say best speech because it's such a break, it's such a, um, a level of of like humility from mm-hmm. someone who's not necessarily always very humble, mm-hmm. and maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't, you know, I guess it's up to each individual person to say how much they want to like take him at his word and all that, but it mm-hmm. seemed like just a very very. Um, you know, uh, human moment. So, are you familiar with Fiona Apple? She's a singer. Correct. I can't Piano tell player. you. Yeah, I couldn't tell you what her songs were, but mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, she just came out with a new album, and it, mm. um, Pitchfork, who I, you know, no offense to Pitchfork, but I don't know how relevant Pitchfork is for a couple decades or at least a decade in the internet era. Pitchfork was like the be all end all of. Um, certainly like indie music and, and probably a lot of pop and mainstream music too. They were just like, it was kind of like Rolling Stone almost where they were just like this authority on, um, you know, music and they mm-hmm. were very hip and yada, yada, yada. I don't know how much they are anymore, but um, it's one of those things where they still obviously hold some clout because they've rated this album, uh, which is entitled uh, Fetch the Bolt Cutters. They've given it a t- perfect 10 rating which hasn't happened in, I think, 12 years. And the last one was um, a Kanye West album, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. Something like, I think it's the only, mm-hmm. it's the only, it's actually the only Kanye West album I've ever listened to, which is a, certainly an admission of my lack of knowledge of his work. Um, but that's all neither here nor there. The point is, um, she released this album. But I will say it's kind of a funny thing. Like there's this like weird give and take gimmick that you're playing. Like you, you don't, you intentionally don't rate things a perfect 10 because you don't, because you want to <clears throat> elevate that thing to a certain thing. But then eventually you're going to have to pick out, like, is it completely organic when you rate something a 10 or is it just like, Hey, like we're going to give this one a 10. It's clearly subjective. Right. So like there's such, there's just inherent, there's a lot of inherent like, political goings on and in, in the fact that you it's not like you've set a policy that you'll never give someone a 10 but then you can only do it in these very very limited mm-hmm. times unless you know maybe in two weeks they'll really they'll make another album that's a perfect 10 and then like they'll you know the whole world shattered but then they can't do it for like another 15 years <clears throat> well yeah it's it's clearly arbitrary and whether they decide to give out one or two tens every year, or they only give it out once every decade or two, is clearly up to them. Yeah, we should write <clears throat> some jokes about perfect tens. Well, I mean, the Baseball Hall of Fame writers have done this for decades. That there was always one or two holdouts, so that people wouldn't get unanimously voted into the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. Willie Mays, clearly not unanimous. Ridiculous. Yeah, it's just this sort of way. Well, no one's good enough to get unanimous now. In the last few years they've changed that but William Mays Warren Spahn Tom Seaver Hank Aaron yeah they're not good enough that everyone in the world who knew anything about baseball <clears throat> knew the day they retired they were going into the Hall of Fame mm-hmm. in fact in many cases five years before they retired they were clearly so good and had such a enormous you know lifetime stats did Clemente get in? Because he got in he earlier. Got, he got in. He, they made an exception to him. You normally have to wait to five years after you stop playing. Mm-hmm. And they did his the first year because he has a tragic death in his 
humanitarian mission. But was it unanimous? <clears throat> was there still some guy I, being like, I, I don't know, guys. I don't know. It was kind of like out of the ordinary. So they, I think it was clearly decided they would put him in the, without waiting the five years. So mm-hmm. I don't know if that was unanimous or not. But, yeah, I mean, he was clearly, I mean, you watch him play, he was just like, just a great, great ball player. Mm-hmm. And everyone who knew anything about baseball knew who he was a Hall of Famer. Mm-hmm. And they, in order to acknowledge the tragedy of death and his death, and that was not like he was something doing something stupid like driving drunk. He was on a humanitarian mission. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but I, but I still don't know if it was unanimous or not. I don't know. Yeah. Well, of course, Mariana Rivera was the, the first unanimous vote, right? Right. So why him? Right. <laughs> it's all it's arbitrary and capricious uh yeah it's funny um so again all that neither being here nor there uh this album is quite good mm-hmm. so at least it's not a you know um it's definitely within the realm of possibility of being a 10 if that means anything um but she's got one song in particular that really impressed me and it's called relay mm-hmm um, and the lyrics are, uh, evil is a relay sport when the one who's burned turns to pass the torch. And it goes, evil is a relay sport when the one who's burned turns to pass the torch. So it's like this real, uh, mm-hmm. um, and then it's, I resent <coughs> you for being raised right. I resent you for being tall. I resent you for never getting any opposition at all. I resent you for having each other. I resent you for being so sure. I resent you for presenting your life like a fucking pro- propaganda brochure. And I see that you keep trying to bait me, and I'd love to get up in your face, but I know if I hate you for hating me, I will have entered the endless race. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, is like exactly what Nixon is saying in that speech. I mean, it's almost literally what he says. But I, this is, but I know if I hate you for hating me, I will have entered the endless race. And then obviously it's a you know a relay. Um, and then he says, Always remember, others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them, and then you destroy yourself. So anyways, this is my, you know, when I have, you know, all these, you know, you go through your life, and on any given day, you have all these thoughts swirling and all these inputs and outputs. So it was just funny that I thought of that speech when we talked about that, Mm -hmm. Um, and then we were talking about Nixon anyways, and I went like on a weird Nixon rabbit hole this last winter and fall, Um I should do more research on this, but interestingly, Pat Nixon seemed like she was quite a uh, unstoppable force. She had a lot of little firsts in the White House, but I got really? I got to do more research on that before I present it. Um, uh, yeah, and then this album comes along, and I'm listening to it, and then the song comes along, and then so those two things just fused as like this weird like you know analogical duality in mm-hmm. my head. So there you go. And today's the fiftieth anniversary of the first Earth Day, and Nixon was the one who signed all these um, environmental laws into into being. Yeah. Well, there you go. So very... Uh, and I don't... You know, he clearly was a conservative guy. I think one of the reasons he signed those laws in because he just happened to be president when the country, the entire country, woke up and said, what? We don't have to have egregiously polluted air and water? We have a choice. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Let's do Plan B. You know, mm-hmm. and he happened to be there, and and they're like, you know, both. It was really a bipartisan acknowledgement to that. You know, we just can't keep shitting in our water supply. It's not a good idea. We will make ourselves sick, mm-hmm. and not it's just us, but supposedly the children and grandchildren we profess to love. You know, it's, it's just like can't do it anymore. And somewhere along the way, we the Republicans especially just decided to stop believing in that. Of course we can kill the environment. We'll just, we'll make money on it. It's like, what's to think about if, you know, it's like one of the things my thoughts for here is, is like, you know, environmental protection gets in the way of corporate profits for some companies and that's intolerable to them. <laughs> Well, this is so funny because going uh, one more thing is it is Earth Day, so Happy Earth Day, and um, or we're recording this on Earth Day. And the other funny thing was yesterday was the uh, anniversary of Prince's death, uh-huh. and I just finished a painting that not only references Prince, mm-hmm. insofar as uh, the figure there, which is sort of Prince 
inhabiting Janelle Monet's body on the moon, mm-hmm. uh, hence the purple suit. But also it has uh, a nice little picture of the Earth in it. So yeah. I thought that was a funny little thing, that tying Prince and Earth Day together on these back-to-back days with this painting that I just completed without mm-hmm. really thinking about either of those anniversaries. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's another little... Two days ago was the anniversary of the uh, the big blowout in the Gulf of Mexico. 420, you mean? Yeah. Oh, I don't think most people associate that with a big blowout in Mexico. No, the, the oil They spill. might associate it with some things in Mexico, but... Right, or in... Colorado and California and Washington. Yeah. <laughs> but no, that was a big um, oil spill in the Gulf uh, 10 years ago. On, wait, the, the Exxon Valdez? No, no, no. That was up in Alaska. This was the uh, Horizon something. Hmm. I can't remember. The, it was the oil derrick. Deepwater Horizon? Deepwater Horizon. Oh, yeah. And that one blew out 10 years ago on uh, Monday, I think it was. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Good thing that didn't happen on Earth Day, huh? Well, it, it was happening on Earth Day because it took them a while to yeah, remember those cameras when it just had the yeah. stuff just spewing out. And now here we are where oil's at a negative. Yeah, that was a, a little blip for some oil contracts, which I, uh, the the interesting thing is yeah. every all the the orthodox economists are always saying, you know, I'm praising the uh these um agility and the um rapid response of markets to, you know, respond to different conditions. You know, they, they're they more agile and quick to respond versus a clunky bureaucratic government type of uh, control. Mm-hmm. But um, despite the fact that oil price has been crashing for weeks and weeks now and the fact that as soon as the virus hit, um, it was relatively easy to predict that oil demand would go down and this was in addition to the already oversupply that caused you know Saudi Arabia and Russia to try to control their output despite all that all these companies are still pumping out oil because they can't figure out there's no market for it and that makes like zero sense if you believe mainstream are orthodox, they s- ortho, you know orthodox economics it's, huh. it's like does not compute <laughs> so that A shows you, so that shows you like Orthodox economics is um, not tightly tethered and tightly aligned to physical reality. Hmm. Are there are they still producing oil? Yeah. Is that why it's negative price? Because they need to put something. The to negative put it, they need price to store is it because it's because they need to store it, right? They had nowhere to store right. it. So they had to pay people to. That was for certain contracts at the end of April or something like that. There was the way these futures oil futures, a lot of people invest in these oil futures and they'll say, oh, I think if I buy it at $30 a barrel now, I expect the price to go up to, say, $31 an hour, dollars a barrel. And, you know, two months ago when I when you have to actually, someone actually has to physically take delivery of these this oil. And so I will buy these barrels now with intent, I will sell them for more later on. What is but it? if no one, if, you're, if you still have this contract and no one's buying it because they expect the price that you bought it from <clears throat> is way higher than what they can buy new contracts for, then it's tough for you for to sell. So, and <clears throat> so what do you do? You have, to, you have to take delivery of it once your contract reaches a certain date. So... These people couldn't sell it because the market was being flooded with even cheaper oil, so they had to basically pay someone to take it. And someone would <clears throat> said, well, I'm going to cost me a lot of money to store this, and I'm going to have to sell it for a cheaper price. So, yes, I'll take it if you pay me $30 mm-hmm. a barrel. Why don't they just give it away? To who? I don't know, like if anyone wants some oil. Right, and what are they going to do? If I was in Houston, I'd like drain my swimming pool and be like, "Yeah, here, come. I don't know, pay me forty dollars a barrel of oil." And yeah, first of all, it's the contract might have been for more than a swimming pool's worth of uh, oh, there's a minimum buy on that, and and the amount of money it would cost you to clean out and (laughs) furbish your swimming pool would probably be more than what you'd make on the deal. Yeah, what is a future? 
a future. It's it's basic one of these wonderful things invented by modern markets where you um, buy the right to buy something in the future. Huh. But are, is there a right of refusal then incorporated in that? You know, I don't know all the details of the contracts. Like anything, there are contracts, and they say, um, well, I will take on this obligation um, under these conditions. For instance, um, if I agree to buy your oil two months from now, you have to, one, give it to me mm. when I say I want it, and two, you have to give it to me at no more than the price I'm buying, agreeing to now. Mm -hmm. And so this whole, so it's, this it's, it's all this like manipulation. It's basically just a form of gambling. It's speculation, all it is. right? Yeah. yeah, it's just it's speculative. A, yeah. So, but are people are making money off this ostensibly? Yeah, that's why they do it. Um, people also lose a lot of money. So there's, is it actually no guarantee gambling that you're going to make it, money? Right, but is it is it gambling? Is it gambling or is it like a front for people to say they're gambling so they can actually manipulate the system to make a bunch of money in a way that's not based on chance? Well, um, no doubt there's people who are trying to game the system. Yeah. That goes without saying in any sort of market right. situation like that. So, so is there is there a, a, is there a point in which a future becomes legal? Like, does someone say, "Oh, we're going to all do these this contracts thing. are legal"? They mean they have they have exchanges where you can go do this stuff. You know, used to be Chicago was a big exchange where, especially for agricultural products and other commodities, where it was kind of like you know you see the old stock market where people buying and selling and writing down their notepads. That's well, the same thing happened, but instead of buying and selling shares of Exxon Mobil, they were buying in shares of um, future contracts on crude oil. But it's so strange. It's like, I get the idea of buying something because you think it's going to rise in value. Mm -hmm. But then, like, why not just buy it now and then sell it <clears throat> when it's going to rise in value? You're buying it before you're, you're paying for the rights to buy it later with the hope that it'll go down? Is it, is it like, is, a f is it buying a future essentially it's shorting then? It, well, it depends. Yeah, it's, it's a form of betting that what you pay for it now, you're going to be able to get it for a better price when you sell it. Mm -hmm. so otherwise, there'd be no reason to do it. A lot of these things are done by um, industries that may be, for instance, Say you your industry uses a lot of natural gas or oil to produce plastics or products. You may buy futures in, as a hedge so that if prices, if you buy some of these futures and prices go up. Yeah, you still have. Then you've already committed to buying these at a lower price. Like locking in a mortgage rate or something yeah, like something that. Yeah, something like that. And then there's people do it purely on speculation because they think they're smart enough to outguess what other people are going to do yeah. and and what conditions will come up. Right. So, but then can that actually drive the market? Like, what were you saying about futures in the, in the oil market right now? Yeah, I mean, if all, all the speculation goes in one direction, it tends to drive the prices of the futures. I like, mean, it's like if you're, if you want to, if you want to go out and buy um, a commodity, say a ton of magnesium or something like that, mm -hmm. because you're, well, if you're, you know, if you're making metal products, you need to buy magnesium. But if you're going to buy magnesium because you you think somewhere along the line, like the company, the country that produces a lot of magnesium is undergoing political turmoil mm -hmm. and the supply of magnesium may start decreasing two or three months down the line, all of a sudden the magnesium you bought today will be worth more than the magnesium that you sell sure. three months from now. Sure. So could I buy... <clears throat> a thousand futures of oil and get paid, you know, forty thousand dollars because it's negative forty dollars a barrel. And then, when they come due, buy them and then just sell them. You can buy and sell pretty much anything 
is if there's a f- physical commodity in the world, you could probably buy and sell it in some market. So why isn't everybody snatching up these barrels at negative prices? Do they actually Because have then to... they have to actually do something with it. They have to actually take physical delivery of it. Yeah. So they have to have some place to store it or they have to have some way to use it. And when the market is glutted, including storage facilities are yeah. topped off, then what are you going to do? Build a storage facility? Yeah. You know, it's Not with like, all the money you're making off of buying well, the negative oil. Well, then, yeah, but you'd have to, first of all, you, you're not going to be able to build a storage facility in three days. Yeah. Or even three weeks. Right. So, um, so these refineries, they keep producing oil even though they have nowhere to put it? Not the refineries. Or the, the, the wells. Right. Yeah, that's a weird thing. It's like in Texas, the Texas Railroad Commission... One, despite the fact that the Texas Railroad Commission, one of their main um, functions is to um, manipulate the price of oil. Because this is not the first thing, time that oil prices have fluctuated wildly. Mm-hmm. You know, back in the early days, at the end of the 18th or the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, a lot of people started drilling well, you know, oil wells in Texas, and all of a sudden they, you know, Anyone who could stick a pipe in the ground was producing millions of barrels of oil. So then all of a sudden, the market got glutted and the prices crashed, which was, you know, well, I spent, you know, half a million dollars putting in this well and, you know, putting the pipelines to pump the oil out to the refineries, whatever. And I can make a profit of oil grows for it. $20 $20 a barrel, but now it's going for $2 a barrel because everyone's selling it and, you know, supply and demand says, oh, now your oil is almost worthless. Mm-hmm. And then so people would shut down, have to shut down because eventually they they can't make any money. So then they would be shut down and then the supply would shrink up and then the price would zoom up and you have this wild fluctuation. So again, the, w- this is one place where the free market doesn't actually exist because the free market in circumstances like that is so chaotic that it just destroys itself. That's mm-hmm. where government, i.e. the Texas Railroad Commission, mm-hmm. comes in and says, you know, if if we only produced X amount of barrels of oil this month instead of two or three times that amount, that will keep the supply in sync with demand and we can get a good price and everyone will be make a profit. So Texas has just recently been doing, considering that, to putting like a 20% decline on Texas-produced crude oil, hmm. um, which Decl- still... A 20% what, discount? Decrease in the amount produced. Oh, okay, gotcha. So that's still not even close to address the global. I mean, I think at the peak we're producing like about 100 million barrels a day, and <clears throat> with the coronavirus thing, the pr- the demand has dropped down to like 70 million or something like that. And um, Russia and Saudi Arabia were said, oh, well, and, and some of their, you know, little other players said, well, let's, well, let's decrease supply by 10 million barrels a day, which is like a 10% decrease. Mm-hmm. But there was still a huge glut on the prop in the global market. So that's where, like, Texas decided, well, maybe we should reduce our output by 20%. Hopefully other places will also reduce so that we can bring supply into sync with demand. Mm-hmm. I don't know what they've de- I don't think they, I don't know if they've decided to do that yet. I think, and then Trump s- said, well, well, the government will buy a lot of oil and put it in their strategic reserves. Mm. Of course, the strategic Seems reserves. Like a reasonable idea. Strategic reserves came about in the 1970s when there was a shortage of oil. So this is supposed to be strategically available. So if we got our oil supply, our imports disrupted, we would have this reserve in the United States, as sitting in big old empty caverns somewhere, mm-hmm. that we would be able to rely on. It wouldn't. We wouldn't, you know, strangle our economy. But now the strategic reserve is. Is there? It's going to be used to absorb excess supply, not decrease, mm. or excess, yeah, excess supply, not decrease supply. That's funny. So again, it's another way where the government is bailing out the uh, 
capitalist system because a capitalist system in and of itself is not able to function long term without repeatedly going into crisis mode. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to say how do you um what is a what is a suggestion to uh mitigate volatility? You have to have extra you have to have extra market fu- functions or forces. Are we supposedly running out of oil too? Like when is this happening? Uh, well, we were running out of we were definitely running out of um, traditional oil. Like you stick a pipe in the ground and mm-hmm. the oil flows out either under pressure or then you pump in steam or something to provide more pressure and mm-hmm. you pump it out. Um, due to fracking, due to Improvements in fracking technology, which incidentally a lot of the R and D for fracking technology was paid for by, oh yes, the U.S. government, <laughs> not the oil industry, but the U.S. government paid for a lot of the initial R and D to develop fracking, and now, and I'm sure now that uh, corporations are also once that they figured out, oh wow, this we can work with this. I'm sure they're all you know, fine-tuning it and trying to figure out how to make it more and more efficient. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, I mean, and the original question was, <laughs> what you... <laughs> oh, well, I was just going to say, how do you... What's what's the suggestion to mitigate volatility in markets? Oh, well, there's only... I mean, markets will become volatile under certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. So now what the um, the answer is is to government control, which is basically the government of Russia and the government of Saudi Arabia agreed to they would try to reduce the supply. The government of Texas is working in their state to try to reduce supply. Trump has tried to from the federal government um Increase demand by mm-hmm. buying it for the fe- mm-hmm. for their reserve, mm-hmm. and I think China also has a some capacity to store excess oil. And right now they're saying, "Well, we know we're going to be burning a certain amount of oil for the next five or ten years. Might as well go buy it now while it's sure really really cheap." So those when it gets price gets low enough, if there's someone who can store it. While they can sell buy it really cheap, the idea that a year from now, two years from now, when the price goes back up, we'll have bought it cheap, and the money we pay for storage will be less than the price differential we'll make out on that. Right. So, do we use the the uh, do, do we ever use the oil in the strategic reserve? Um, there was talk about it when. Um, when oil was going up, like I think in the end of Bush administration, when it had gone up to like eighty, ninety, hundred dollars a barrel, there was talking about then to take some of those um, oil out of strategic reserves to increase the global supply, thereby push down price. Yep. And that's kind of like, well, is is you know price manipulation really a a strategic? Uh, you know, threat that you have to deal with because that's what it was for, so that the the economy wouldn't be strangled if we lost our export supplies. Now, with the amount of oil they're producing with fracking, we most of the oil we import, we we basically export after we refine it. So mm. we import crude and export refined products. But we, as at last I understood that. Um, we produce enough oil within the United States to meet our needs. And the oil we import, we basically refine and export as refined products. Hmm. Yeah, the global economy is so is so strange to me, why, how it's actually economical to do all these... Um, like, it's, it's more economical to ship something around the world on a big boat than it is to just be like self-sufficient it's yeah it's, strange to it's me. amazing how cheap it is to ship stuff halfway around the globe if you're doing it in a huge cargo ship 
mm-hmm. where you can literally put millions and millions of pounds on a ship and sail it all halfway around the world. So your price per pound becomes very, very cheap. Mm-hmm. So why don't we just nationalize our oil? <laughs> Because we live in the U.S. of A., where capitalism is one of our fundamental tenets. But it's just so it's it's, it's so cockamamie to me that we it's like so we produce all this oil more than we need, mm-hmm. but then we don't keep it for ourselves. Instead, we sell it. Well, we, most of it, most of the oil we produce, we consume. But th- what's happened is we import additional oil, mm-hmm. refine it, and then export it as refined products. So basically, if Mm -hmm. we didn't have that extra in and out, we would basically just consume what we produce. So the only oil we buy is stuff that we refine and then sell as like, because we have a good refinery process? Apparently there's enough refinery process there so that there's excess refinery process so it's worthwhile to import it, refine it, and sell it for a higher price. Plus, the labor to take it out of the ground in other countries is much cheaper than here, right? Yeah, so it's not just the labor, it but if, for instance, fracking is much more expensive to remove a barrel of oil from with fracking than it is from just, like, pumping it out of this big, giant pool of oil mm-hmm. underground, which is what most of Texas oil used to be. Yeah. But then, you know, after many decades, they've consumed most of that, so now they're going to fracking, which is more difficult, more expensive to extract. So whereas Saudi Arabia, all their oil is basically the old-fashioned one where you stick a pipe in the ground and you cost you a few dollars a barrel to pump it out versus fracking may cost you $20, $30 a barrel to extract it. So if oil is $40, $50 a barrel and it costs you $30 to extract it, then you can make a profit. But if you're paying $30 a barrel to extract it and the price of oil goes to $20 a barrel, then you're losing $10 for a barrel for every barrel you extract. The problem with that, a lot of these companies, fracking companies, are so leveraged, they're so much in debt, that they can't afford not to have income mm-hmm. because they have to pay off their loans. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it gets it gets it gets really complicated. It's not what, really it's fast. It's not how they tell you to run your life in the personal finance no. classes. No, nope. you're running a constant deficit. Yeah. So and it depends where you are. In, in certain fracking areas, are the cost to produce a barrel is less than others. And of course, the main thing is when it's important to understand when you look at long term effects. Um, when the companies go to extract oil with fracking. The only reason they're doing fracking is because they've already gotten most of the cheap oil out of the ground. Where all you have to do is stick a pipe in it, and maybe put a, you know, put some steam pressure on one end of the field and push help push the oil out. The reason they're going to fracking is they've already consumed most of the cheap oil, mm-hmm. the easy oil. So now they go on to the next way to get out oil, which is fracking. And shale and, sands and all these. Yeah, like a couple, and, four or five different, like, right. sort of these secondary options, right? And when they go to do fracking, they don't just randomly stick a pipe in the ground and start fracking it. They, you know, the geology imaging they have now with their sonic imaging, it's almost like a CAT scan of your underground. So they... they start off by going to the most productive, cheapest to produce wells first. So it's pretty much predictable that each year that the cost of fracking will go up and up unless they can have um, counteracting improvements and technology that make it cheaper. But there's, you know, who knows where that limit is, but we know that. Well, it sounds like it's already been passed if these companies are only staying alive by taking deposits so they can keep their operation going. Yeah, it depends upon the particular field that and the particular company, and there's a lot of variables that go into it. But like the tar sands in Canada, tar are sands. Like, when I said shale sands, I meant to say yeah, tar sands. I think f- until the price of oil goes up, they're like, they're, they're done. Yeah. 
Well, certainly if it's at a negative price, then yeah. Well, negative price, no one can make money at a negative price. But, I mean, that was just for a certain series of futures contracts, which have now come washed out of the system. So mm -hmm. that will probably won't happen again anytime soon. Yeah. I thought fracking was only natural gas. No, you can do it for oil, too. Huh. And some wells produce oil and natural gas because huh. they sometimes they're found co-located. Just pump them out together. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what Eddie Bauer does. Yeah. I've seen his little software where he's controlling a well from hundreds of miles away and mm -hmm. making small little, you know, articulations to go, you know. Right, so that they drill, see it on a grid drill where the pockets are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's very yeah, it's, sophisticated stuff. Well, that's what he always says. He says, like, the oil and gas industry has better technology than anyone in the whole world. I mean, it's, it's or better than any industry, you know, because it's really <clears throat> such a complicated, well, yeah, well, and they I'm, have so much capital, so. Right. And, I mean, for what, at that scale, they might be true. I mean, the microchip fabs also have extremely sophisticated but it's at a different scale a different type of level sure yeah this is more of like a physical technology yeah. although highly computer dependent well microchips are physical too but they're, they're the nano scale instead of the tens of yards scale <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah yeah the oil market's another one of those things that's uh very strange right now why don't all the i mean i guess this is what opec kind of does but i mean couldn't all these companies just get together and be like listen everybody like stop making oil or why don't we just lie and tell people we've stopped making oil so the demand will go back up so we can start make, making some money off of this stuff you like you if just, you have excess yeah. demand you can always sell it for a price that indicates that it's you know it's like a limited edition item like you might have more items of those than you're saying but you're only releasing a certain amount of them they can even though they have more oil they can just say oh we're only selling this much oil can't well, they well, you'd think that... Inflate demand. You would think that the oil producers, w and o OPEC did this for a while, would get together and say, listen, if we produce 100 million barrels a day right now, th the market will be flooded and the price will collapse. If we got together and produced 70 million barrels a day, we could charge 60 70 $80 a barrel, and we'd make a lot more money. We could sell half as we could sell two thirds as much oil for twice the price, and we'd make more money for twice as long too. Because then you're right. not, then you're not, then you your amount of demand is you right. Know, you know, cumulative cumulative capacity goes a longer way. Well, it makes sense, except that's not the way individual states. They're not always so they'll they, try. They they're always just they trying to undercut each other. In some cases, they feel that they have to. If you're like. Kuwait or Iran, you may feel, I need this money so desperately, I can't cut back. Mm. Let the rich guys cut back if that's a problem. But I can't cut back because I can't afford to drop in revenue. Yeah. Of course, they're going to have a drop in revenue anyway, but they want Russia and Saudi Arabia and the United States to be the ones who cut back because they can afford it nominally. Yeah, But... Um, yeah, so Yeah, so you just have different levels of desperation and motivation yeah. on different sides. Mm -hmm. So it'll Do you think the oil, do you think the the uh market will recover? Do you think the industry will recover? Or is this like a telltale sign? Um I will, guess in the 80s it probably seemed pretty with a oil shortage, so that was a different circumstance. Well, yeah, toward the end of the... How is there a shortage, by the way, if we still have all this oil on the ground? Was it before these new technologies are sort of... Yeah, the um, Hubbard's Peak was the uh, operating theory in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and then after the new millennium started. And that was based on this guy... Um, M. King Hubbard, I think was his name. He's a big-time oil geologist. And he basically looked at the curves, and he said, hmm, we're going up, you know. And he looked at, like, individual fields, and he noticed, like, it's a parabolic um, curve. You know, you start up steep, and you get 
producing, and then after a while you hit your peak that you can produce from that field, mm -hmm. and then you're tailing off going down the other side of the parabolic curve. Sure. Well, he said the bigger market is just a summation of all those smaller, smaller curves. And basically he said, well, you know, come around, um, oh, I forget what the prediction was, like 1970-something. And he was making these predictions back in the 1950s. He said something like 1970, plus or minus five years, that the U.S. will reach their peak of conventional oil production. And he basically nailed it pretty much within a a year or so. Yeah. And so from the 70s on, we started importing more and more oil, which then when the 70s oil crunch hit, then there was a long waiting lines for people to buy gasoline. People, you know, you'd see pictures from from the time where people had their cars lined up oh, yeah. for a mile waiting to get into the gas station. And well, because they only had certain hours, right? Right, and there's a limited supply, and there was, you know, all this thing, well, this is just a conspiracy to drive up the price of gas, and, you know, like, there is always. But it was because OPEC started stopped selling us oil, and so we became supply constrained. And then once thing eased, that's when they came up with the Federal Strategic Reser Oil Reserve, so that the next time that the squeeze was put on, we'd have this reserve in reserve, and we could use that to tide us over mm -hmm. till things got normal again. Mm -hmm. So that was like in the 70s, and then, I don't know, maybe in the last 10, 15 years, when fracking started becoming more and more common, um... I mean, even back in Jimmy Carter's time, we knew there was huge amounts of shale that had oil in it, but there was no really economic and energy-efficient way to extract it. Right. Now, with the fracking, that solved that issue, at least for the better shale fields, at least for now. Yeah. Of course, it's done it at large extent in terms of its you know, usage of water and producing toxic waste at the end and um, yeah we're already uh forgive the pun but scraping the bottom of the barrel right i mean as it is well that's people disagree on that people say oh yeah well, there's always more shale we'll always find a better way to be more efficient for extracting it but physically it's always going to get, keep getting harder and harder to get more oil out of the ground unless someone finds like this huge you know oil pool underneath the Arctic ice cap mm. or something like that, or Antarctica. Um, well, is that a possibility if the if the planet's warming too? If you get to the point where there's no ice in the Arctic um, during the half of the year, then that means the war planet will be warming up so much, and so many other things will, will be going haywire. Yeah, that having enough oil will be <laughs> one of our minor problems. Yeah. Rather but than look, minor. but look, we we got more oil. Yeah, <laughs> the thing that got us. No, here I mean, and some of the some of the wacko crazies who says you know have, they have this idea that well global warming is good because that gives us more access to oil in the Arctic, and what what are you going to do with that oil? Well, we're going to burn it so we increase global warming mm -hmm. even more mm -hmm. so that way we can melt Antarctic too yep. and that way sea levels will dry, rise about 200 feet and 200 we, feet yeah if if we melt all the ice on Greenland then the sea levels will rise about 22 feet which means Miami's gone most of Florida is underwater yeah. New Orleans gone Houston gone yeah. m much of New York's gone much of Boston Shanghai um um, Calcutta, but this well, is a lot of you know cities are just going to be underwater. That's that's if Greenland goes. Now, if Antarctica, all the ice in Antarctic melts, then we don't go another twenty two feet higher. We go an additional two hundred feet higher sea level. I, I'm not I'm not saying this in any goodbye, London. Goodbye, Netherlands. Well, goodbye. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm not I'm not saying this in any sort of advocational way, but I do think it's almost just like the human species we're almost like a procrastinatory species as a whole. There's certainly mm-hmm. some people that are preparatory, but largely we're proc- we're reactionary, I feel right. like. And we also ha- it's a strange combination. We also have to happen to be very good at adaptation and we also happen to be it's like we're no it's like we know we're good at adaptation so that allows us to procrastinate but don't you think that there will be like we've undertaken so many irrationally large projects as humans like don't you think that we could just build a levy around new york city i mean isn't that it's not necessarily the the smart way to do it of course but don't you think that there's a difference between building a levy of 10 or 20 feet and then around a certain area and building a level levy of say 100 feet over a much much larger area right and also, but, it's not cheap. And also, no, of course not. <clears throat> then you have to worry about, for instance, Houston. When um, the uh, Hurricane Harvey said came and hit it, if Houston had a levee all the way around it, uh-huh. they would have had to open the levee to let the water out. Huh. Not not Assuming to keep the it water went from over the levee. Well, no, it did come over. It came in in the form of rain. Yeah. So right. they needed. Right. They would have had to open up the levee or had pumps to pump the water outside the city. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Like in New York's case, I don't know how you. You'd have to. You'd have yeah. to build it so far out from shore that you're just creating. It'd be like a lock, basically. Yeah. You know. Yeah. No, you have to let ships come in and out of the harbor. Yeah. But then you'd have to say, when are the ships coming in and out of the harbor? You know, well, they have to come in at low tide, mm-hmm. maybe, so that you know makes it easier to not flood the city and so and it it would be a huge 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 project it would cost much much more than they thought it would Mm -hmm. and that's assume it lasted more than a few years before being undermined by storms or whatever and it would cost just a huge amount of money and energy Mm -hmm. why not use that huge amount of money and energy to turn your economy into a an economy run by renewable energy and 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 you know do the simple way you know let me see let me see i could um i could invest um hundreds of millions of dollars finding out how to you know get really sophisticated scanning machines and train legions of doctors and all their you know ancillary health workers and produce you know all sorts of massive drugs and treatments to treat lung cancer or we could stop smoking Right. Which is cheaper. Well, and by the way, and by the way, which is better for you, the patient? <laughs> it's just like. But what But what I'm saying is that I, I'm certainly not advocating this, and that's why I'm saying, that's why I'm being clear about that. But given what appears to be the reality, like also you, you have to look at patterns of what is. Mm-hmm. When you define reality, right? right? I mean, scientifically, you have to look at human behavior and and follow the pattern of what we've done. Right? Is it not st- like there's no there's no agenda behind this? But is it still possible? Like, if this happens, do you think the human species still has enough um, power to 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 hold these things at bay, even if it's in like a very not well thought out, reactionary, expensive, inefficient way. Um, one or two really wealthy areas might do it. Is India going to do it for Calcutta? Yeah. Um, is in, you know, are they going to do it for the Cairo? Or are they going to do it for um, I don't know any Miami or I mean, are they going to do it for like a? 20 or 30 big coastal areas? I mean... Well, these are the questions that arise. Yeah, and the thing is, why would you want to paint yourself into a corner where your only option is to choose between two really, really very expensive, disruptive, horrible, traumatic choices? Mm-hmm. That's, not a, that's not a logical thing to do. No. That would be a basically insane thing to do. But that's where we're headed. And <clears throat> people, the average person, if you could tell them, if you could say, well, um, we know that there's a lot of civilizations that have come before us that are no longer there. They've collapsed. They 
dissipated. They went away. And this really, people have been studying, archaeologists and various um, scientists have been studying what happened to these cultures. Why did they go away? And I think that by far and away, the biggest, single biggest reason is because of environmental degradation. And we know we're doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, 500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, they may not have had the knowledge to understand what they were doing and why their civilization was faltering. They just didn't have the technical scientific wherewithal. But now we do. So why don't we use it to avoid dissolution, to avoid mm -hmm. collapse? Mm -hmm. Well, it may be because humans are incapable of thinking at that level of logic and discipline that, so that we will collapse. And it's not because we didn't have the technology or the knowledge. It's because humans are so fallible that they will they will shoot themselves in the foot rather than admit that they n need to do something mm -hmm. different than what they've already been they've been doing all their life. Mm -hmm. the, do you think it's it very 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 tough to tell anyone anything that they don't want to hear. Yeah. And so many people in this country and around the world they don't want to hear that the way they are living their life is inherently destructive and unsustainable. Despite the fact that if they allowed themselves to hear that, they would be given they would be also be able to hear that their options so that they can still live the way they want to, but they will have to adapt as to how they go about doing that. So it's it's uh it's like you know if you're an alcoholic or drug addict, how do you when do you finally say that's it that's enough, and some people reach what they call hitting bottom and they Rock say bottom. okay, and other people don't. In our society right now, there's plenty of people who know what the science tells them. They know what history tells them. They know what the physical evidence tells them, and they want to change. And there's other people who said, no, not going to change. Do you think it's a, do you think at all it's like a, a numbers game? Like, and this is a whole other, we'll have to have, we'll have to pick up in this conversation because I got to do a little base reading and then I got to prep you or, or just give you some time to think about your answers. But, cause I know Einstein has this like light speed problem, right? Where you can't, it's like this, it's, it's kind of like law of diminishing returns where you, the closer you get to light speed, the harder it is to get there and then finally there's this like little like weird barrier where you can't actually ever attain light speed in yeah, the physical um, universe. Yeah, the faster you go, the greater your mass is. So the more you energy you need to accelerate, the ever greater mass, which becomes ever greater as you, you down. as you approach the speed of light, which and which is that that comes the paradox of what a photon because photon has a rest mass of 0, but it does have mass. Yeah. So somehow Light be attract, uh, achieved mass despite the fact that it's at the speed of light. So, do you think this is this is an analogy I'm trying to draw? Is that like, do you think that's what humans are like, and maybe all civilizations are like, where even though we accrue more and more technology because things grow ever more complicated and even though we have more and more individual humans because they are intertwined and that becomes more complicated, it becomes more and more difficult to have like a clear ob objective defined path and that all that intertwining creates like, even though, even though again, paradoxically, even though we accrue greater and greater amounts of technology and ability, mm -hmm. our, our web of human social order and interaction makes it m more and more difficult to actually achieve sustainability as a species because of that complexity? Um, Does that make any sense? This, the, some of the complexity in terms of increased knowledge about how the physical world works does is not readily held and 
potentially. I don't, th you know, I don't think the average person would have a really tough time understanding how global warming works if they just sat down and had someone give them the basic explanation. The problem in the United States is there's a certain percentage of the electorate which will not, which will adamantly refuse to hear that information. Right, but what I'm saying is maybe that subset of people comes is a is a natural byproduct of the enlargement in general. It's like basically like, is it easier for a small community to survive than a global society? Even though in in theory we have all these things that can we we're we're gaining knowledge from parts of the world we've never had access to before but in doing so it, it you're you're shoving all these diff, disparate ideologies against each other and it can become like combustible and anti-productive um i'm not sure the ideologies necessarily um i mean like you can have different I ideologies and they will all accept certain aspects of modern technology like <clears throat> you can say go to the um the the Isla um islamic people in the mid east you can go to the um the people in japan with their shinto religion or buddhism and in india with their buddhism and hindi and africa where they have some tribal religions and central america which is mostly catholic and North America, its product, or you know, the Jewish, all those, all those cultures, for the most part, will accept things like modern medicine, jet aircraft, cell phones. They don't seem to have a problem agreeing on that stuff. Mm -hmm. I think the big problem with global warming is um, there's winners and losers in the transition, mm -hmm. and the losers have a huge amount of money and political influence, and they've c conducted this massive, well-funded <clears throat> propaganda that global warming is a hoax and it's just there to destroy the you know the economy and it's like, and without bothering to actually understand, I mean the the people who promote the propaganda understand that they're telling lies and they're manipulating people for their own narrow personal. Is, is that do you, do you hold that to be a fact? Well, I mean, ExxonMobil did some of the early research on global warming, and they said, oh, yeah, CO2 goes in the atmosphere, acts as an insulating blanket, more heat is retained into the biosphere, things warm up. Like, it's physics, you know? It's it's not like some <clears throat> someone who's in 1900 is trying to figure out how DNA works. Mm -hmm. They knew what was happening. On a political level, though, do you think there's politicians who, who don't, th who don't, um, who aren't s trying to steer people away from it in a manipulative fashion? There's some. There's such thing as called willful ignorance. Mm -hmm. Like you know, you know that if you learn about this something, you'll have to change your mind or at least take a position. Mm -hmm. And so they just refuse to learn mm -hmm. because they've already made a commitment for political reasons right. and or ideological, emotional reasons that this is not going to work for them in terms of their narrow, short-term interests, and which is all they really care about. Yeah. So therefore, if their vote in the Senate or the House condemns future generations to needless suffering, they don't care. It's 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 a complete abstraction to them. Uh -huh. What they care about is, oh, I get reelected, I get power, I get money, I get egotistical stroking, whatever it is. That's all they care about. Uh -huh. I mean, and you you can they they may deny that on a stack of Bibles, but huh. you know, as the saying goes, actions speak louder than words. So their actions say who they are. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, um, all those incentives, that was the other thing I wanted to touch on is we, we briefly in episode five touched on, um, Martin Luther King, uh, three, oh, I said, you said he had three major speeches. I said he had three speeches that I thought would rank in the <clears throat> top, at least top 20, if not top 10 of the all time most important political speeches given in the history of America. Mm-hmm. 
Another thing I want, <clears throat> I, I thought it'd be, well, I thought there was like three specific evils that he talked about. So we both had an idea. This, we're hung up on this three for some reason and there was three evils and apparently there was another speech that on uh august august of 1967 uh national conference on new politics in chicago and he calls but this is where it gets tricky because this video says here he speaks about what he calls the triple evils war racism and poverty mm-hmm. but now i'm on this other site um, oh, August 31st, deliver the three evils of society speech in the National Conference of New Politics, um, which is the most prophetic and revolutionary address to date on the questions of militarism, poverty, and racism. Yeah, he covered um, a lot of the same stuff in his on Vietnam speech, I think. Okay, <coughs> but that was a different speech. Right. But this is funny because he... he um, the two uh, descriptions weren't um, oh, militarism, poverty, and racism. That's funny because I just I was reading another um, thing that described it as as materialism, but maybe I just re- misread materialism as militarism. <laughs> I'm a little tired. They're kind of related. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, war, racism, and poverty were uh, defined uh, what he defined as the three evils. And yeah, I think he started to, to talk about how exactly those things were interrelated as well. Um, but it seems like if someone is being willfully ignorant in a, po- a political position of power, then they're definitely tapping into some of that. Um, I was going to go somewhere else with this too. My show notes. Um, Oh, well. Uh, do you want to open some mail? Sure. All right. We have this mail here. Uh, <coughs> you got me. You brought me some mail, and this is a funny little coincidence, too. So the first piece of mail I got being the successful businessman that I am, I get lots of solicitations for a credit card <coughs> from credit card companies, mm-hmm. and uh, I got two of these. Two of these. They look the same. There's an invitation included. Yeah, they, they're they're. I didn't respond to the first one, so they solicited me again because they're I'm a real hot commodity and they're seeking my business. So this. <laughs> so now this is it's from a, the black card. That's all it says. It doesn't even have a return. Uh, oh, it does say stamp. Mastercard black card. When you open it up, but yeah. when you get the envelope, it just says black card. It sounds yeah. like the the FBI is trying to well, it does have the master card will go down there. That's true, but there's no return address. No, I uh, that uh, <clears throat> that anytime there's no return address, I, I immediately become suspicious. Yeah, I I bring it back to the post office and say return to sender. I don't actually do that, but I would like to start if I had a lot of money and more money and more time than I currently have. It'd be a completely kind of wasteful thing to do but it'd be fun just to well you could just if it's addressed to you you could you could say return to sender and drop it back in the mailbox oh really and in this case they'll probably um just toss it away yeah it would be fun to send all the stuff back to them because in theory mail is a correspondence right um so we open it up here and then we have this beautiful it says luxury card and then it also says apply now, which is a little bit of nice, uh, gentle pressure. And then it's telling me it wants me to think about life without limits, which is a trademarked phrase that they've um, trademarked here. Yeah. And here's my application for the MasterCard black card. It tells me I can experience more. Which is also <coughs> a registered trademark. Right. And then, uh, oh, they give me an envelope. I, 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 think, th- I think they should re- trademark their 16.49% of interest. <laughs> That's low. Usually these things go up to... Well, k- APR for cash advances is 27 yeah, There you go. Now, I, I think they should trademark that. Is <laughs> we will screw you royally. <laughs> but my favorite part of... Oh, it's only four ninety five for an annual fee. 
So they're only going to charge... $495? For an annual fee. Yeah. So they're going to charge you $495. <laughs> you could pay them $495 for the um, the privilege of borrowing their money at like 15 to 16% more than they what they cost them to... Because they want me to experience more. More, yeah, more debt, more <laughs> poverty. Give us your money so you can experience more poverty. Apply now. Maybe maybe luxury is just being, uh, you know, buried in debt. Yeah, and, and ignorance is strength. <laughs> and war is peace. So for $495 a year, I can have life without limits. Yeah. Like maybe maybe they'll put maybe that means they I, they won't even put a cap on the interest rate you know like it's an unlimited interest <clears> rate <throat> that's what that's what Spectrum's great about yes yeah, sli- s- sign up for debt slavery and <laughs> and have no limits to your mis- misery <laughs> but here's where they really get you okay here's where um if all if all that didn't persuade you. There's a very well laid out graphic here, mm-hmm. and this is the this card is the heavyweight champ, which connotes you know some sort of strength and power right. and athle- 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 athletic ability. Right now, the, the heavyweight champ is also a registered trademark, but this is a trademark instead of just a registered something. So maybe that means they put even more legal weight behind it. Anyways, so the black card comes in at a whopping 22 grams right. of weight. So, you know, you can feel the the physical representation of all the debt that you're right. piling yourself into. You can right. feel the luxury in the back of your pocket. Feel the luxury of being weighed down by, their, by your debt. Look at this. The American Express Platinum card, which is also a registered trademark <coughs> or registered copyright, that only weighs a paltry 18 grams well that's an indication that's not really made out of platinum because in that case it would be much heavier <laughs> i bet that's only like a 200 dollar <coughs> annual fee and then the chase sapphire reserve which also sounds very yeah, I'm, uh, I'm guessing that's not made out of sapphire either that's only 13 grams and then we have the city prestige card and that's a that's a you know just disrespectful 12 grams yep and the thing is there's people who are well paid to come up with this bullshit well they better be well paid i mean you know <laughs> if i if i'm going <coughs> to get marked a you know 22 gram luxury card with a 16 percent annual apr interest well I, you know i want some it better be goddamn luxurious <laughs> it's a pv decoded metal card and where does that say that you think i should oh, black pvd coded i wonder what the pvd stands for polyvinyl dimethyl <laughs> arsenic or something like <laughs> yeah, that that's the other great thing i bet it has got <coughs> some carcinogenic product in it too let's look it up pvd physical vapor deposition Oh, could be. Physical a, vapor a, a deposition. Describes a variety of vacuum deposition, deposition. I just want to say deposition makes me sound like a lawyer. Physical Methods which can be used to deposition. produce thin so, films and coatings. Yeah, could be. Maybe that's put some of the things there so that they, uh, I don't know what that's for. Well, I'm sure a lot of the... You know, maybe that's what my four hundred ninety-five dollar annual fee is going towards—the research, the scientific research to create. Maybe, it. maybe that's used for your little chip there, but I don't know why that would need to be. Huh. I mean, let's try to make this piece of plastic as expensive as possible, so you think you're not getting ripped off, which of course you are. Do you think I should apply? Uh, only if you're sick in the head. <laughs> I mean, do you have a credit card now? <laughs> I got seven of them. <laughs> but none of them weigh 22 grams. Well, Why, they can... might not all weigh 22 grams combined. So much better. You know, in some in some um, arenas, being lightweight is 
is luxury. Like if you're having a bicycle, being lighter is supposed to be, you know, more prestigious and useful. I should I should write them back with a essay on Colin Chapman and his uh, quest to add lightness when designing his Lotus motor cars. Oh yeah. You think they'll? Uh... I think they would immediately just toss it aside. I don't think they're at all. All they want is your money. So that's they're not interested in any intelligent feedback. They just want money. Mm-hmm. But at least they're not racists. <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> yeah, I wonder, uh, you know, you, you wonder who they're, you know, marketing these towards. Um, okay, also what I got in the mail today, and you brought this over, thank you very much, was, <laughs> so in New York State, a great thing is that you can, um, if you have your car registered and insured as a, in a historical class, mm-hmm. you can get what are called period accurate plates. So you can buy uh-huh. an old license plate from the time the car was manufactured and legally have that on your vehicle. Uh-huh. So I have these plates on my 1986 Ford Aerostar currently. However, I found another license plate that I thought was even better, and I applied. And this is funny because with coronavirus, I thought the DMV was closing everything. So I sent this out thinking maybe I'd get a response in, like, you know, September, and they sent it back really quickly. And it's only, like, $3.95 to well, get this, which yeah. is really cheap for, a you know, New York State bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. So what I've gotten now, my new registration. Hot and spicy. <laughs> so that's a that's a vanity plate that someone made, and you know I think these ran from '86 to 2000. These uh, New York plates. So this will be gracing the front of my uh, my Aerostar. And that was funny because all the, this was a serendipitous because you found this on the you were and this is a vehicular thing too. Were you walking on the side of the road in yeah. Latham? Yeah. Just uh, you know. Seeing what you could scrounge up in the... No, I just had time to kill while I was waiting for my car to be serviced. And mm-hmm. um, you couldn't wait inside the... Back up a little bit on the mic. Couldn't would, couldn't wait inside the normal service yeah. waiting room because social distancing, etc. cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, anti-social distancing, sort of, but then par- parenthetically social, anti-social, <laughs> social distancing. <laughs> And you can go through iterations of that. But anyhow, I just saw it on the side of the road, and I said, I mean, amongst the, like, thousands and thousands of other pieces of debris along the side of the road. <laughs> um, and I said, well, a license plate from the Virgin Islands. And more, I just stuck it in my backpack, and looking at it later, I said, well, it must be just like a uh, souvenir plate because based on the uh, the number and on the mm, plate. U.S. Virgin Islands 2020. Yeah, so it means... Uh, 2006. You know, I guess if you went there during that time and you wanted to commemorate your visit, mm-hmm. you could take that and put on... You know, if, say if you're in one of those states that doesn't have to have a state license plate on the front, you could put it on the front of your car or mm-hmm. hang it on your wall or whatever. Yeah. Or throw it on the side of the road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> whatever you want to do. <laughs> yeah. It's a free country. Yeah. I bet this weighs more than 22 grams. Uh, I don't know. No, definitely. I think it's probably, it feels like it might be aluminum. Mm-hmm. 22 grams is about, about three quarters of an ounce, something like that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I was a drug dealer, I could probably tell you. Well, we've got a little scale at home so we can measure it. That's true. Um. All right. Well, th- th- it's nice that St. Croix is on there because uh, Clyde Frazier's uh, second residence is in St. Croix, but uh-huh. he's too afraid to fly there right now because of coronavirus. Well. So he's just hanging out in Harlem. So I heard. He he became news recently because uh, he, he, he there's a footage of him. Have you heard about this Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance? Mm, maybe. Oh, it's about their la- their um, his final season with the Bulls. Okay. A lot more stuff than I realized was going on. Um, inner turmoil. It's funny mm-hmm. to look back when you, you know you're a little kid growing up. You see the Bulls and it's like, oh yeah, like dominant championship. And now, like when the Warriors were having their, um, you know, dynasty sort of mm-hmm. like, uh, and it was funny because Steve yeah, Kerr, the short-lived dynasty. 
Yes, but you realize how hard to, it is to keep it together watching mm-hmm. this one yep. about the bulls. Um, and it's funny because Steve Kerr, he must have been like just laughing the whole inside when he heard all these people asking him all these questions. He must have been reliving all this stuff because he was right there when mm-hmm. all this stuff was going down right. with the bulls, with egos yeah. and, and GMs and players and like yeah. all this stuff. So Clyde Frazier, when Jordan got drafted, said he would never be able to carry a team because he wasn't seven feet tall. Uh-huh. And in hindsight, now that looks like a very silly statement to be making. Right. Um, however, in case, neither was Magic Johnson or um, um, Kobe Bryant. Right, sure. But the, the funny thing was, they asked him about it, and he kind of like defended his comments. He was mm-hmm. like, "Well, I said that when he got drafted, and then six years later, he still hadn't won a championship, and nobody really knew if it was going to be the truth either. And he still says Wilt Chamberlain, he thinks, was the greatest player of all time, and not Jordan. He said when you think about, it was like Oscar Robinson was versatility, um, Wilt Chamberlain was like dominance, and then Bill Russell was like winning. Right. And the Russell and Chamberlain obviously were seven footers. Well, um, Russell wasn't. I don't. I don't think Russell was quite. Seven oh, he wasn't. Foot. I think he was like six. 10 or something huh. like that. Okay. He was a little bit shorter. But, and the thing, Russell and Chamberlain were buds. Mm-hmm. You know, when they would, when um, the Celtics would come to, I think, what, Philly or something like that, wherever Russell Chamberlain was playing, they would have dinner together at their one of their mother's houses. This well, this is a great this is a great story from the Last Dance because Danny Ainge, the when the Bulls played the Celtics in the playoffs, Jordan's second year after he came back from his foot injury, mm-hmm. which is another amazing story about how he basically just didn't listen to his doctors and went and started going and playing pickup basketball while he was supposed to be like resting, um, which would probably never happen today. But um, him and Danny Ainge went golfing before Game Two, and I guess Danny Ainge took a lot of money off him because, mm-hmm. you know, they're obviously big gamblers or right. Jordan's definitely a big gambler. And so then Jordan got all pissed off and he scored 63 points the next day, but they lost. But um, yeah, a lot of, yeah, it's just some interesting stories. Yeah. It's a good it's Yeah, good. well, I remember speaking about basketball stories, Chamberlain and um, Russell were playing it <clears throat> uh, in a game. And as um, one of the... Um, Celtics players, when he would he'd be coming along the back of the baseline, like they were in the low post or something, and mm-hmm. they when when he came by, the rush the Celtics player was smacking Chamberlain like in the back, just to uh, distract him and annoy him. Mm-hmm. And supposedly Bill Russell told him, "Cut that shit out." And he said, "He was, what are you doing there? Well, I'm trying to distract him." He says, "Cut that shit out. He's going to get mad. He's going to take it out on me." Oh yeah. <laughs> All the best players, they feed on, <clears throat> they'll use anything and feed on it. It's amazing. Yeah. That's what they were saying about Jordan, If you're not too. competitive, you're not going to get to the top. Yeah. I, I mean, most of these guys are take competitiveness to the brink of insanity. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, there's a price to winning, I think, as Jordan yeah. said. Yeah. Um, so we, we have to be, uh, we have some technological, uh, reasons that we're going to have to wrap up today. We have to make it a short one basically cause I was too lazy to change over the tapes. So I'll just break the fourth wall there. <laughs> but before we do, we should probably tell some jokes, right? Uh, some, I think that isn't some, that a de rigueur? Yes, I agree. And these jokes are brought to you by some old granddad that I know who may or may not distill Kentucky bourbon and his name's old granddad. And these jokes are not dad jokes they're old granddad jokes brought to you by old granddad, old granddad, the jokes on you unofficially sponsored by some old granddad. I know who may or may not happen to distill liquor. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. There you go. You know, as an American, I'm all for having choice and freedom. So I like it when I walk into the store and have to decide between 26 different types of toothpaste. But when I hear some of these cross genders or whatever they are calling themselves dressing up like girls' clothing and talking about agency over their bodies and spreading this cockamamie idea of uh, there being nuance in sexual identity, well, that's where I check out. Okay. I'm looking for the joke there. <laughs> it's a nice. Uh, 
going back to the premise of your joke with the toothpaste, the real joke is if you actually look at the ingredients of those 26 different varieties of toothpaste, they uh-huh. only, only have one or two active ingredients. Uh-huh. They all have fluoride, and some of them may have um, the anti-sensitivity uh, thing, the... Um, Nitrous. So what you're trying to say is just like in humans, despite all our differences in our souls, we're very, very similar. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a marketing baloney. <laughs> <laughs> See, I may, I may be behind the um, curve on um, the um, scuttlebutt on certain high profile personalities okay. so I'll, I'll let the uh, viewer decide <laughs> okay. what this means it sure must have been a hard decision for Meghan Markle and Prince Harry to leave behind the royal family especially their uncle Andrew isn't Andrew, people will know isn't, what that isn't Andrew is the whole his brother <laughs> no Andrew is Harry is Philip's brother and Andrew is embroiled in this whole Epstein thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, oh well, that is, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Especially their uncle Andrew, yeah. Nice guy. Okay, now I got, okay, yeah, I remember Andrew embarrassing himself in mm-hmm. that interview where yeah. he said he wouldn't, you know, doesn't see why he, or he wouldn't do anything different knowing who this person was who he's associated with. Yeah. Because he, you know, introduced him to good people. It's like. Yeah, that he um Yeah, seems like a nice guy. He seemed like a real really, really messed up individual. <laughs> yeah, and what's with all these pronouns? He, she, it, they, them. Over sixty pronouns out there now. You think these people have would have something better to do with their time, like like spending hours a day on Amazon shopping for personalized laser engraved toenail clippers, for instance. There are so many, so many good ways to spend our time. Okay. You know what they say, denial is not just a river in China. It's true. (laughs) On that note, (laughs) uh, this has been Jankytown USA. Jankytown USA brought to you always and unofficially by Beck's Non-Alcoholic. Beck's Non-Alcoholic. It's beer. Are we out? Yeah, we're out. We're out. Across the room, there's nothing dark to fear. Hi, hi, ho, ho, happy little fat man, me. Hi, hi, ho, ho, happy little fat man, me. Hi, hi, ho, ho, happy little fat man.